And good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, wherever you are watching me today. My name is Evan Wiener. I have been a journalist since 1971, and I've never been at the Olympics. However, throughout the course of my career, particularly in the 1980s and 1990s and going into the early 21st century, I was around a lot of people who were involved with the Olympics, uh, including the former majority uh, leader of the United States Senate, George Mitchell, who uh, wrote a paper about how corrupt the Olympics were in the late uh, 1990s, early 21st century. And one, Antonio Samaranch, who was the uh, International Olympic Committee's president in the 1980s and 1990s, and also people from the United States Olympic Committee. Will there be a Tokyo 2020 Olympics starting on July 23rd? Of course, the games must go on. Even in the middle of a global pandemic, the games must go on because it's all about money, all about money. And there are too many people who have invested too much money into the Tokyo Olympics that it will be called off. It's going to be safe. Trust the IOC people. They say it's going to be safe. They mean it. Whether you believe it or not, it's another story, but they mean it. The games must go on. That's an Olympics mantra from 1972 after the Munich massacre by Avery Brundage when he was addressing uh, the media and others uh, whether or not the Olympics should have been called in 1972 after nine Israeli uh, athletes and two Israeli coaches were killed. The games must go on and they will go on in Tokyo because uh, it's money to be made. Uh, the International Olympic Committee they think of themselves as a sovereign nation in a lot of ways. Uh, the International Olympic Committee has permanent observer status of the United Nations, like the Vatican. They act like a sovereign nation, whereas all they are is a sports organization. But they require presidents and prime ministers and other leaders of countries to genuflect in front of them during the Olympics bidding. If you want the Olympics in your country, you better send the top man or the top woman in the country, and they better get on their hands and knees and beg um, these, these earls and these barons and these lords who run the IOC, beg them to give, for them to give you the Olympics. In the case of the 2020 Tokyo Olympics, in the event of the pandemic getting worse again, um, it isn't the country of Japan calling the shots. It's the International Olympic Committee. They will ultimately decide whether to go ahead with the Olympics and the Paralympics or not. Japan has, no, has nothing to say. And that's the deal that was cut between the International Olympic Committee and the Tokyo Bid Committee. Oh yeah, Japan, you know what? Taxpayers, you wanna send us billions upon billions of dollars to build all these venues that you have to build so we can make money off of them. Hey, that's great, that's great, that's great. Uh, oh, uh, deciding on whether the pandemic is too dangerous. Nah, that's in our hands, and it is. Guys like him, John Coates, an Australian lawyer who is the vice president of the International Olympic Committee. Thomas Bach is the president of the International Olympic Committee, and in May of 2021, they were not worried that 10 areas in Japan, including Tokyo, were in the lockdown. Coates, the IOC vice president, recently said it was clearer than ever that the games will be safe for everyone participating as well as the general public in Japan. Uh, I have never seen a picture of Coates in the laboratory looking into a microscope because he's a lawyer, but we have to take his word for it because he says, well, it's clearer than ever, the games are going to be safe for everybody participating, including the general public in Japan. Games must go on, even though the Tokyo Medical Practitioners Association pointed out, hospitals have their hands full and have almost no capacity left to deal with a possible outbreak triggered by the Olympics. Now that was in early June to mid June and the Tokyo Medical Practitioners Association told the IOC, anybody gets sick connected to the Olympics, they're on their own. Japan COVID-19 lockdown. Well, that was a major problem at hand. Japan was in a major lockdown until May 31st and until recently they have come out of the lockdown. But during the lockdown, 
There was a poll taken by a newspaper which suggested that three fifths of the country's residents think the games must not go on because of the pandemic. Go home, go home, go home. Japan's gonna take a massive hit in the range of billions of dollars or yen, whether the event takes place or not. Um, still, the IOC is taking a blind eye to everything going on. COVID-19 can lock down the country, but not an Olympics. Go home, no Olympics. Sure, we'll lose money. We'd rather lose money than have an outbreak in Japan. In June, the Japanese government, remember, they still don't have any jurisdiction over the actual event. The Japanese government and the International Olympic Committee agreed to bar tourists from entering Japan to watch the games in person. But millions of people in Japan could attend the competition at the more than 40 venues in and around Tokyo. Oh, by the way, about those tourists, you know, there are packages that are sold uh, and they're sold ahead of time. They were sold in 2018, 2019, into 2020 before the pandemic hit. And uh, the companies who are brokering uh, your trips or somebody's trips to Japan, no, uh, no, 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 you're not getting your money back. Act to God. We had nothing. Yeah, no, we're keeping your money. We are keeping your money. And uh, there are going to be all kinds of lawsuits over the fact that people actually bought packages to go to Japan to watch the Olympics, can't. And the companies that uh, were the brokers said, mm, too bad, you're not getting your money back. The IOC told the Wall Street Journal in June it had entered into the operational delivery phase of the Olympics and that it has become clearer than ever that these games will be safe for everyone participating and the Japanese people. Guys like Thomas Bach, guys like uh, John Coates, guys like Dick Pound from Montreal. He's an International Olympic Committee delegate from Canada. It's gonna be safe, not gonna be a problem. Uh, in June, you have demonstrations, masks on, cancel the Olympics. But is it safe? It's a good question. The IOC is not going to answer this. Japan might. Japan's having massive problems getting its citizens vaccinated against COVID-19. Uh, as of June 8th, only 4% of the Japanese population got a shot. Japan hopes to have most of its population vaccinated by November way too late for the Olympics, way too late for the Paralympics, but the games must go on. And there's a Brazilian athlete getting vaccinated. Uh, an International Olympic Committee spokesperson claims that well above 80% of the residents of the Olympic and Paralympic village in Tokyo will be vaccinated and somewhere between 70 and 80% of the media will be vaccinated. China offered to uh, use its vaccine to all the Olympians. Um, that vaccine is not very effective, but China did offer it. The games must go on. Uh, and uh, it was postponed last year, in the middle of March, uh, the Tokyo 2020 Olympics. As late as mid-March, Thomas Bach, the IOC president, was insisting the 2020 Tokyo Olympics would take place as scheduled on July 24th, 2020. But the Olympic Committee started to get on box back and said, you know, maybe not, maybe not. Maybe, just maybe it would be wiser to shelve the plans and hold the gatherings at another time when the COVID drug treatments and vaccines are readily available. Of course, the COVID vaccine became available last winter uh, and it was postponed. It was postponed in March of 2020 because of the outbreak of COVID-19. Uh, COVID-19 cases were increasing in Japan and there was a fight among the Japanese organizers and the Japanese government about the cost of delaying the event. And Japan's gonna take a financial hit on this and who should be paying the extra expenses that uh, were going to come due? They're still arguing about that. Uh, Suga Yashahidi is the prime minister of Japan. And he knows that uh, the Japanese Olympics will be costing more than $25 billion. Business and media interests want the games to go ahead as planned. In the United States, Comcast has the rights to the Olympics. It's on NBC, it's on the NBC 
uh, affiliated cable networks such as uh, MSNBC, such as uh, CNBC, USA, and uh, NBC Sportsnet, which is going out of business literally after the Olympics. Uh, it's looked upon, and they need they need the uh, program because they spent an awful lot of money on the programming, and they have gotten an awful lot of money from uh, marketing partners, and they do not have the ability or want to have the ability for givebacks to pay the money back to the uh, manu uh, the uh, marketing partners. Uh, the prime minister of Japan's ability to successfully host the Olympics is seen as a political task of his handling the pandemic. The games must go on, they will go on. No foreign fans, no local spectators, venues limited to 50% capacity or up to 10,000 fans, all of whom must follow COVID-19 protocols, including mask wearing and no loud cheering. Can't cheer. I don't know if you can whistle, but you can't cheer. Uh, but if you look at the Olympics, and that's supposed to start on July 23rd, if you look at the Olympics, you will find that it's more than a sporting event. It's business, culture, and even some whacked out scientific research. The modern Olympics began in Athens in 1896. The games would become totally politicized by 1936. However, uh, in that 40 year run up between uh, 1896 and 1936, a lot of strange things had happened at the Olympics. That is a woman's, uh, a, that is a woman's Olympic tennis player, 1900, dressed rather modestly. But in 1904, the Olympics went a little strange. It's called anthropology. Days. And in conjunction with the 1904 World's Fair in St. Louis, the Olympics ended up in St. Louis. And a guy by the name of Sullivan decided, hey, let's experiment. In 1904, Olympics organizers sanctioned what was known as Anthropology Days. Two-day event in St. Louis where so-called uncivilized tribes, mostly from Africa, competed in the Olympic events of the day. James E. Sullivan brought the games to St. Louis to coincide with the 1904 World's Fair. And Sullivan's goal? To prove the two-day event was meant to show or to prove that Anglo-Americans' cultural superiority uh, was there and how savages could not compete in sports. And there were all kinds of events over the two days. And uh, these so-called savages, human beings, um, couldn't compete because they weren't trained. They weren't trained at all. That is the guy who uh, brought the Olympics back to life, Baron D. Uh, Baron Pierre de Corbetin. Um, you would know this, so, or you do know this, if you hang around the IOC long enough. There are barons, there are earls, there are lords, all kinds of people with titles that somehow are connected to this thing. And um, not only did they have anthropology days, they didn't want women around. So we experiment with anthropology days and get rid of the women. Um, and uh, the Baron, yeah, let's get rid of women's sports. Let's get rid of the women's sports. Stockholm, 1912. The Baron and many of his IOC colleagues believed an Olympiad with females would be impractical, uninteresting, unesthetic, and improper. Uh, we'll let you have two sports, fencing and swimming. Everybody else gone can't compete in track and field, we're all gone. Spencing okay, swimming okay. But um, this rower by the name of Alice Milliette from France uh, wasn't gonna take this line down. She said, let us back in. They said, no. She said, well, I'll show you, I'll show you. Remember, this is the time of the suffragette movement in the United States and women are advancing in terms of getting more rights. Um, and she decides, along with others, let's do an Olympics of women. And she does. The alternative to the male-centric game became the Women's Olympics. And there were four, 1922 in Paris, 1926, Gothenburg, Sweden, 1940 in Prague, 1934 in London. And the participants came from North America, Western Europe, and Japan. The New York Times was very impressed with the women in 1922. 
Uh, an article, 1922 times, uh, the women, it was notable for the development of women athletes in all branches of competitions fitting to their sex. Remarkable progress was made by them almost overnight. They assumed the place of great prominence in the world of athletics. Now remember at this time, women were moving ahead in athletics. Uh, you had uh, a woman uh, named Edith Cummings, who was a great amateur golfer, who uh, was the first woman to be on the cover of Time magazine back in 1923 or so, uh, because she won a golf tournament. She was also one of the characters, uh, Jordan Baker in uh, The Great Gatsby, because somewhere along the line, she hooked up with F. Scott Fitzgerald. Uh, and then there was Gertrude uh, Everly, who swam the English Channel uh, in 1926 and got a ticker tape parade. So women were making a lot of strides at this point. Um, the Olympics would disappear. The women Olympics would disappear after four of them because they were allowed into the regular Olympics. Uh, that is me and my wife with Franklin Roosevelt and Eleanor Roosevelt up in Hyde Park in September of 2017. Franklin, really, really, he and Eleanor, gracious guests, a little stiff, didn't move around a bunch, but uh, Franklin never did because uh, he was in the wheelchair. And uh, they had some books, nice books to read and all that, but I was there for three reasons. One is to talk about the 1936 Olympics. One, to talk because I do other talks about Roosevelt being the first man on TV in the United States, 1939 World's Fair in Flushing Meadow. And also, why did baseball continue after uh, Pearl Harbor Day, December 7th, 1941? But for these purposes, let's talk about the 1946 Olympics. Highly politicized, highly politicized. Hitler Olympics. Uh, the United States goes there and they justify Hitler's uh, regime. Uh, 1935, the former assistant secretary for the United States Navy, a guy by the name of Ernest Lee Janky uh, and Jeremiah Mahoney both pushed for the American boycott of the 1936 Berlin Summer Games. Uh, Mahoney was president of the athletic of the Amateur Athletic Union, and um, he was the one that picked the people on the Olympics. And uh, in 1931, they voted the AAU to have games in Germany because they wanted Germany to. Uh, be back in the family of nations. This is prior to Hitler, but Hitler comes to power in 1933. Janke, who was an American International Olympic Committee delegate, expressed outrage with the reports of what was happening within Hitler's Germany. And on November 25th, 1935, he sends a letter to the IOC president, Count, say I told you, Earls, Lords, Barons, Count, this is a Count. Henri Belay Latour, floating the I year of an American boycott of the 1936 Berlin Olympic Games. Judge Jeremiah Mahoney, yeah, let's drop out of it too. That was December 8, 1935, and he would go on tour with a number of Catholic leaders, including uh, Al Smith, the governor of New York, and uh, Massachusetts Governor James Curley, both of them Catholic, calling for the boycott, but it fell on deaf ears. Uh, Avery Brundage, who ironically would take uh, Jenke's uh, place as an IOC delegate, uh, was kind of a business partner of Germany at that time and kind of knew the Fuhrer and said that, oh, everything's gonna be good. Everything's gonna be good. Don't you worry about it. Everything's gonna be good. Uh, the Berlin or Hitler Olympics politically charged, but Franklin Roosevelt, the president of the United States, urged the American team to go to the Berlin Games knowing full well about the strangulation of Jewish rights in Germany. Um, Avery Brundage is the head of the US Olympic Committee and he overrules the AAU and tells the Olympians, you're gonna compete in Berlin. Um, now, I knew Marty Glickman, worked with Marty Glickman in the 1980s. I knew Sam Stoller. He ran the Milrose Games and uh, Gretel Bergman, uh, Gretel Bergman, Margaret Lambert, I interviewed in 1993. Uh, they never performed in that Olympics. Jesse Owens did. In fact, he took Marty Glickman's place and he stole the Olympics thunder from Adolf Hitler by winning all those gold medals. They were all impacted by the Berlin Games. Let's start with Gretel. 
who died uh, four years ago at the age of 103 in Forest Hills. She simply was the best athlete in Europe, maybe in the world, uh, in 1933, 34, 35, that period. She was a great, great athlete who won all kinds of uh, events leading up to the 1936 Olympics. Two weeks before the Olympics began, she was from Germany. Uh, the German officials informed the Jewish athlete, Gretel Bergman, you're not making this team. She had equaled the German women's record in the high jump. And with this action, Germany sacrificed a chance for a gold medal. So I got to interview Gretel Bergman in 1993 at the New York Athletic Club. I'm there with Marv Schneider. And uh, Marv used to allow me, even though he was about 25 years older than me, he used to allow me to ask the first questions. And I only had one question initially for Gretel Bergman, who at this point is known as Margaret Lambert, Margaret, her given name in Germany, and Lambert, she married Dr. Bruno Lambert, a fellow athlete, and they fled to the United States in 1937. And um, the question was pretty simple. Why? I had to give my people hope. You don't understand what was going on. We were losing rights day by day by day by day by day. We were becoming undignified. I was the great Jewish hope. I wanted to give my people some hope. She, like a lot of other German Jews, had to leave, and she was able to get out. In 1937, Gretel Bergman was able to obtain papers that allowed her to immigrate to the United States. She landed in New York City. She had $10 in her pocket. That's all she was allowed to take out of Germany. And um, she got to Ellis Island and then to New York City. And she came over with Dr. Bruno Lambert, who was her boyfriend at the time, a fellow athlete. And he too only had $10 in his pocket and they would start a new life in the United States. She would work as a masseuse, a housemaid, later as a physical therapist. And there is Gretel Bergman, Margaret Lambert on the uh, left. And on the right is Dr. Bruno Lambert, who I never met. She continued though to participate in sports she was not quite an American citizen yet, but she was in the United States and she competed with the United States so uh, national team, 1937 and 1938. She was US Women's High Jump Champion. In addition to being the shot put, shot put champion, she married Dr. Bruno Lambert in 1938. She became a citizen in 1942. She always hoped that there would be an Olympics in 1940 or maybe even 1944. Because of the war, there was no Olympics in 1940 or 44. Uh, Marty Glickman told me the same thing. He was going to come back in 1940. Never did, no Olympics. Uh, she fades, Gretel Bergman fades into obscurity, and uh, she is inducted into the uh, Jewish Hall of Fame at the Wingate Institute in Israel in 1980, and that is when she becomes viable again. Her legacy, she gets a gold medal at the 1996 Atlanta Games. She was persuaded by Russ Levinson and Fuchs over at uh, HBO because they wanted to do a special on her. And they hounded her and hounded her and hounded her because as of 1993, she was not going back to Germany. There's no way she was going back to Germany. But Levinson and Fuchs over from HBO Sports said, come on, Margaret, let's go. We're going to do a nice documentary. Let's go, let's go, let's go. And in 1999, okay, I'll go. And she went back and she found out the stadium in uh, Lapham uh, was uh, named in her honor. Uh, she used to train there. And the HBO special came out in 2004. It's called Hitler's Pawn, P-A-W-N. It's an excellent show. Uh, I, recommended, I recommend it to you uh, if you want to know more that Gretel Bergman and what was going on in the 1936 Hitler Olympics. And she would die four years ago at the age of 103. It's Marty Glickman on the left, the fastest kid in Brooklyn. Sam Stoller on the right. And they make the American track and field team and they're supposed to be in the relays. But something happened along the way to running the relays in Berlin. Uh, their coach, Dean Crowder, saying you're not running. 
Marley always suspected it was Avery Brundage who pulled the strings there. Uh, Marley was 18, and he thought he was going to run again in 1940. Sam was 21, so he also thought he was going to run again in 1940. Um, Marley's theory was that Avery Brundage did not want to see two Jews from New York winning gold medals in the relay. That's part of the race that they were in. And uh, so he, he benched them. He benched them for Ralph Metcalf and Jesse Owens. Owens would win those gold medals and the Fuhrer would turn his back on Jesse Owens because this was supposed to be the coming out party for the Aryan nation. And the Aryan nation was beaten by a black man who was depicted as a monkey in uh, German newspapers. Um, by the way, uh, the 1940 Winter Olympics was supposed to be in Sapporo, Japan. Um, unfortunately, there was the war between China and Japan, and um, the IOC decided to pull out of Sapporo. They were hoping to put in Switzerland. Switzerland said no. So they ended up giving the 1940, after the war started, Germany and, uh, and, and Poland and World War I, September 1, 1939, we're going to have the uh, Winter Games in Munich, and in 1944, the Winter Games in Mussolini's Italy. Uh, Marty and Sam never got to compete in the Olympics. But it's more than just Germany, it's South Africa as well, because it's a political platform. Please boycott, please boycott apartheid sport. August 18th, 1964, South Africa is banned from the Olympics. Why? Well, they can't go to the 18th Olympic Games in Tokyo because they refuse to condemn and end apartheid. Uh, South Africa was also tossed out of the 1968 Olympics in Mexico City. And finally, the International Olympic Committee's Group of Nations in 1971 because they were clinging on to apartheid. And speaking of 1968, well, that was a mass protest by not only uh, Tommy Smith in the middle and John Carlos on the right, but Peter Norman from Australia on the left. Um, Tommy Smith wanted to boycott the 1968 Mexico City Olympics. Uh, and these were his demands before he decided that uh, he was going to participate. Remove South Africa and Rhodesia. Uninvite them from the Olympic movement. Restore Muhammad Ali's world heavyweight boxing title. After all, Ali, who refused in 1967 to be inducted into the United States military, was never given uh, due process. Uh, he was stripped of his belt by the World Boxing Association and his license by the New York State Athletic Commission, all without due process. Avery Brundage stepped down as president of the International Olympic Committee and hire more African-American assistant, uh, assistant coaches in track and field and other sports. Ultimately, Smith decided he was in, in the Olympics, but uh, he was part of the Olympic Project for Human Rights. And a protest was planned between Tommy Smith and John Carlos, and they would walk to the podium after winning their medals, presumably, and they would be able to walk to the podium. And this is what they were going to do. They were going to take off their shoes to protest poverty. They were going to wear beads in the scarf to protest lynchings. And when the national anthem was played, they lowered their heads in defiance and raised their fists in a black power salute that rocked the world. And there is the picture of that and uh, the two gloves that they're wearing. Uh, Smith and Carlos, uh, Peter Norman suggested the two split the gloves. One put it on the right hand, one put it on the left hand. And for that, Peter Norman would get himself in trouble in Australia. Uh, I don't like the idea of people looking at it as a negative. Tommy Smith recently said there was nothing but a raised fist in the air and a bowed head acknowledging the American flag, the American flag, not symbolizing it for hate or not symboling uh, or not symbolizing. Okay, let's start that again. There was nothing but a raised fist in the air and a bowed head acknowledging the American flag, not symbolizing a hatred for it. Carlos would end up working as a guidance counselor uh, at Palm Springs High School in California. And he told the Guardian newspaper recently, I had a moral obligation to step up. Morality was a far greater force than the rules and regulations they had.
Smith went on to become a college coach. He was at Oberlin when my wife's cousin was there and playing football and track and field and my wife's cousin and uh, Tommy Smith have remained friendly ever since he was there back in the uh, late 1970s. Meanwhile, Peter Norman, on his left breast in that picture, the Australian wore a small badge that read Olympic Project for Human Rights. It was an organization set up in 1967 by Harry Edwards, who ended up being a university professor at Cal Berkeley, guy who I had lunch with or breakfast with in Indianapolis in 2001. He looked at me and says, come to lunch with me. And I said, yes, sir. He was, is six foot 10 and weighs over 300 pounds. And um, he started explaining life to me that day, for which I'm grateful. Uh, we were at the uh, National Football League Scouting Combine in Indianapolis. And uh, I mentioned that because uh, Harry Edwards is the link between Smith and Carlos and uh, Kaepernick, Colin Kaepernick, the San Francisco 49ers quarterback who in 2016 took a knee and got blackballed, protesting police violence, among other things, against African-Americans. And uh, Harry led Colin through the phases that he was going to go through. Norman suggested, Peter Norman, the Australian, suggested Carlos and Smith split their gloves. And he asked a member of the United States rowing team if he could borrow a badge that read Olympic Project for Human Rights, a project set up to oppose racism in sports. Tommy Smith ended up in professional football with the American Football League in the last year of the non-merged American Football League and National Football League, even though they were merged, had a common draft, they played each other in exhibition games, and of course there was a Super Bowl. And uh, Kaepernick was uh, blackballed from the National Football League. That's all you could say about Kaepernick, but he wasn't. He got a shot. I once talked to Paul Brown about that, uh, who was the coach of Cincinnati at the time. And Paul Brown went back to 1946 when he was the coach of the Cleveland Browns at the All-American Football Conference. And uh, he had two players on his team, uh, Bill Willis and Marion Motley, that he had to bench because they were African-American and Cleveland was supposed to play in Miami. They were getting death threats. And Paul Brown said, uh, can't do this to them. They got to stay home. Paul told me, I don't care if they're green, yellow, red, blue, or black. Or white, if they can play and they're solid citizens, they're on my football team. And uh, Smith would play one year with the Bengals, 1969. Carlos would play, well, Carlos wouldn't play with Philadelphia Eagles. He was injured and he never played and he played one year in the Canadian Football League. And that's Brett Musburger, who somehow has survived uh, since 1968 and now is doing one of his favorite things, which is being a gambling tote in Las Vegas. Um, Musburger in 1968 was a columnist for the Chicago American newspaper. And when he watched the protest, he said or wrote, Smith and Carlos looked like a couple of black skinned stormtroopers holding aloft their black gloved hands during the playing of the national anthem. They sprinkled their symbolism with black track shoes and black scarves and black power medals. It's destined to go down as one of the most unsuitable demonstrations in the history of protests. Uh, not quite, Brent. Uh, there are statues of these guys today for what they did in 1968, and you're, you're pushing gamble. That's what you're doing now. Uh, in 2017, the football announcer went on Twitter and, and was talking about Kaepernick. Yo, 49ers, since you instigated protests, two wins and 19 losses, how about taking your next knee in the other team's end zone? Uh, whenever Brent Musburger has been in the vicinity of Tommy Smith or John Carlos, he runs scared. He runs away from them. He could uh, sure dish it out, but he couldn't take it. Uh, the medals, Smith and Carlos, were, they kept their medals. They were not taken away from them, nor were they ever asked to return their medals to the International Olympic Committee. In 1972, the Munich Olympics, the first time terrorism, uh, was brought into American homes, into the living room. Nine Israeli athletes killed, two coaches killed. Uh, the massacre, the Munich massacre, 
Uh, the day of terror started at 4.30 in the morning, local time, September 5th, 1972, 10.30 back on the East Coast on September 4th. Eight Palestinian militants affiliated with Black September militant offshoot of the Palestinian group Fatah scaled the fence surrounding the Olympic Village in Munich, disguised as athletes and using stolen keys, they forced their way into the quarters of the Israeli Olympic team. The end game. About 10 o'clock that night, four o'clock in the afternoon, New York time, September 5th, German officials thought they had an agreement with the terrorists, and the terrorists led their bound and blindfolded hostages from their quarters into buses, transported them to waiting helicopters. The Germans were planning an ambush. It failed. Jim McKay was on ABC telling you what was going on in Munich for about 14 hours, did one, one heck of a job, did the profession proud, Jim McKay. Uh, and he kept going, going, going. And by the way, he wasn't wearing full pants. He was wearing swim trunks when he did it because ABC said, you got to come over here real quick. This is going on. Throw on the shirt, tie, jacket. We're going to shoot you from the waist up anyway, so it doesn't matter. And McKay was on the air and on the air. By 12.30, September 6th, local time, the shooting had stopped. 20-hour reign of terror over. 11 Israelis killed. One Munich policeman killed. Five Black September terrorists lay dead. Black September was an offshoot of the Palestinian Liberation Organization. Three of the gunmen captured. At 3.30 or 3 a.m. Munich time, 9 o'clock New York time, McKay is on about 14 hours, and he summarized the tragic outcome of the botched rescue by saying, they're all gone. The failure, German authorities never did storm Building 31, where the Olympic uh, Israelis were living. They allowed the terrorists to take their hostages by helicopter to a nearby military base there. The Germans had planned an ambush and rescue mission, but it was badly bungled. The failure, nine Israeli hostages killed by a combination of terrorist gunfire and a hand grenade one of the Palestinians sent off in the helicopter as it sat on the ground. Uh, I, I, I knew that guy. Uh, I, 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 let me say this about that. Uh, I first started dealing with him in, in 1985. Uh, Richard Nixon, president of the United States in 1972 is furious, absolutely furious. He sends a telegram to Avery Brundage, the head of the International Olympic Committee, demanding that the rest of the games be called off. But hey, listen, the IOC thinks it's a nation unto itself. He can make decisions, doesn't have to listen to the most powerful man in the world, the president of the United States. Now we're going to do what we're going to do. And the games must go on. Oh, yeah, they must go on. There's Avery Brundage. Um, the next day, he's out there, and uh, uh, it's a it's really a cheerleading, pom-pom, pomp and circumstances. Hey, aren't we great? There was that memorial service, September 6th, and Brundage announced the games must go on. Oh, this is from the same guy who, uh, before the Munich Olympics, said that the 1936 Hitler games were the finest ever. Brundage was a central character in German Olympics history. Mark Spitz was there. He won all those gold medals in 1999. I had a chance to talk to Mark Spitz at length about what was going on and how he reacted to things. And this is the interview that uh, you're going to hear that I conducted with Spitz, or I'm going to read it to you. The Jewish American swimmer Mark Spitz set a gold, uh, set a world record of winning seven uh, gold medals, and he was sprinted out of Munich to London in fear he would be the target of other terrorists. Uh, news conference celebrating Spitz's achievements was canceled. Uh, and this is what he told me in 1999. Swimming program had stopped. I swam all of my events. And that evening, the last day of competition was on Monday. And this happened on a Tuesday morning. Swimming was through, so I didn't have to compete anymore. I had a press conference right afterwards on Tuesday. And that's when everyone told me about this Israeli tragedy or the thing that was happening at the time. It hadn't turned into a major tragedy at the moment, at least at that time. They didn't know much about it. The next day, the next day I was with, the next day I was whisked away. Brundage, Brundage was filled with compassion. 
they offer the 27 word tribute to our Israeli friends. The games must go on. Brundage, who was the International Olympic Committee, which meant he ordered the competitions to resume after a pause of 34 hours. How it goes, Sal and I used to know one another before he perished back in the mid 1990s. I'm still friends with uh, his grandsons, Justin, Colin, and Jared. Jared uh, is an ESPN lawyer, which runs in the family, since Howard was one. Uh, Colin is the New York Mets public address announcer, and Justin is a principal at a charter school. And Howard used to say about Avery Brundage that he came of age during the time of William of Orange. And I was in Delft one day um, in the Netherlands, and I passed this bar. William von Orange, Grand Cafe, sent that picture to the Cosell kids, and they were laughing. That's what Papa used to say. Apartheid in the Olympic boycott of 1976. Uh, African-American countries, or rather African countries, boycotted the 1976 Olympics. There were 25 of them. They skipped the Olympics because a New Zealand rugby team played contests in apartheid South Africa. The African countries told the IOC, knock out New Zealand. The IOC said, we're not going to do it. So the countries walked away from the, uh, from the Olympics. And the games were played, or the events took place at what was called the Big O, but now it's called the Big O, O-W-E, because of the amount of money that Montreal, Quebec, and Canada owed to pay down the debt for the 1976 Olympics. The Olympic Stadium was supposed to cost $250 million Canadian and ended up with a price tag of $1.4 billion Canadian. The city, province, and Canada didn't pay off the debt from the 1976 Montreal Olympics until November 2006, 30 years after the closing ceremonies. That is Jim Craig in 1995, and that is my son. Uh, we were at Radio, uh, we were at Radio City Music Hall and also the Rockefeller Plaza Skating Center as uh, the um, 1980 U.S. Olympic team was honored 15 years for winning the gold medal in 1980 in Lake Placid, and also the 1960 U.S. Olympic team honored as well 35 years since they won a gold medal. Um, all of this is 1980. Olympics is all taking place with the backdrop of uh, the Christmas Eve 1979 Soviet Union invasion of Afghanistan. The 1980 games, supposed to be in Moscow. And the United States President Jimmy Carter says uh, to the United States Olympic Committee, um, they don't get out of Afghanistan, you're not going to the 1980 Moscow Olympics. And there was a Carter doctrine that was uh, introduced on Meet the Press in 1980 with Lawrence Spivak on NBC. The Carter Doctrine, which said the Soviets attempt to gain control of Afghanistan and possibly the region was regarded as a threat to US interests and Carter was prepared to meet the threat with military force. Comes on January 20th. It's an ultimatum on the NBC show, Meet the Press. Unless the Soviets withdraw their troops within a month from Afghanistan, the games had to be moved from Moscow to an alternative site or to multiple sites postponed or canceled or the United States was not showing up. And um, the United States Olympic hockey team is playing up in Lake Placid. The tension of the Cold War is going on all around them. And they're playing the Soviet Union. That's on February 22nd, 1980. A few weeks earlier, the Soviet Union blew the doors in on the US Olympic hockey team bunch of collegiate kids and one pro player and Herb Brooks, uh, who I knew. <laughs> I said to Herb Brooks one day, there was a movie about this team. And I said, you know, you look just like Carl Baldwin. That nose, that nose. And he was going to punch me out. He got really upset at me, but uh, for the moment anyway. Uh, anyway, uh, February 24th, 1980, the United States Olympic hockey team beat Finland to win the gold medal at the Lake Placid Olympics. That was an achievement. But many people thought that uh, the United States beat the Soviets to win the gold medal. The game was never seen live in the United States unless you were in Buffalo or in Detroit, border towns, CBC in Canada showed it live. And um, it was on delay tape. Many people watched it that night. 
uh, but many people had no idea that uh, the team was even playing. And it was the round robin, the, the round robin tournament. It's down to the last four, and they have some strange rules in the Olympics. You can end up winning one game, losing one game. But if you score the most goals, you're going to win the gold medal. Um, so the United States does beat the Soviet Union by a goal. However, if the United States loses to Finland on February 24th and the Soviets run up the score in Czechoslovakia, the Soviets could win the gold medal. The American team was made up of mostly college players. They upset the heavily favored Soviet uh, team. The Cold War is in the background. The Soviets have set up shop in Afghanistan. The Olympics become a bigger than life stage for these college kids. And they won the game. Uh, the Americans winning means that the game would take on a life of its own. It became known as Miracle on Ice because of the ABC announcer, Al Michaels, end of the game. Paul, do you believe in miracles? Yes. The Lake Placid game was the first event where the USA, USA chant was heard. Carter did call the team to congratulate them for beating the Soviets, but it was really only a game. That's all it was, entertainment. However, however, you probably can't name a more political and culturally significant game played in sports in the 20th century than that hockey game between the Soviets and the Americans on February 22nd, 1980 in Lake Placid, New York. Newsweek asks the question, should we boycott the Olympics? On March 21st, Carter announces the US will boycott the Olympic Games scheduled to take place that summer in Moscow. The announcement comes after the Soviet Union failed to comply with Carter's February 20th, 1980 deadline to withdraw its troops from Afghanistan. Grain is a weapon. Uh, Carter increased the pressure on the Soviets, not only the Olympics were gone or was gone, uh, to abandon the war, but uh, there would be a trade embargo. Country, USSR, needed these two items desperately, grain, and informational technology. He also restricted Soviet fishing in American controlled waters. The US team consisted of 160 athletes, coaches, and support staff. And if any of them decided they were gonna to go to Moscow, their passports were going to be revoked. The Soviet boycott. Carter got others to follow his lead, but Britain, France, Greece, and Australia said, uh-uh. Canada, West Germany, and Japan joined the boycott. Oh, there is a 1980 Olympic legacy. You know, he spent all this money in, in California and is spending at least a half billion dollars to uh, aid the Los Angeles 2028 Olympics. Uh, what is the legacy of the Olympics? Well, yeah, it's that game and USA, USA, and you believe in miracles and all that. That's, that's one of the few legacies of the Olympics that endures movies and all that. Uh, but the other one that many people don't talk about, the 1980 Lake Plastic Olympic, uh, Olympic legacy, the Olympic Village was turned into a prison. Carter's initiative was a failure. Soviets stayed in Afghanistan until 1989. The Soviets and the Warsaw Bloc countries boycotted the 1984. Los Angeles games. Oh, that's my friend, Rennie Henry. And he was in the Oval Office. Well, not the Oval Office. He was in an office next to the Oval Office with a lawyer by the name of James Argue. Great lawyer name, Argue. Peter Ubrah. They're bidding for the 1984 Olympics in Los Angeles and they want to get Carter's help. Carter never meets with them that day. So they cool their heels and finally leave. Uh, but um, Carter's not helping them out. The International Olympic Committee would give uh, the 1984 games to Los Angeles, and there was a requirement. Don't build anything. They did build a villager. Um, no other group bid for the 1984 Olympics. I should take that back. Tehran wanted the Olympics. The IOC wanted nothing to do with Iran. So basically, Peter Uberoff saved the Olympics, along with uh, Harry Usher and Shelley Saltman and Harvey Schiller and Rennie Henry and all these other people who are my friends. Well, Uberoff's not my friend, and Harry passed away a long time ago. But um, the Olympics made a profit in 1984 because the IOC was so desperate to have an Olympics that they didn't care 
if there were any new facilities or not, you brought would commercialize the games and the, LA, the LAOC turned a profit. Virtually every Olympic host has lost money since 1984. The 2004 Athens Games contributed to Greece's insolvency. So, uh, the Soviets and Warsaw Pact countries boycotted the 84 Olympic Games. The 1996 Atlanta legacy, well, Richard Jewell was accused of setting a bomb that killed somebody. Ultimately, they found out it wasn't him. Uh, and the stadium is left over. It once uh, was the home of the Atlanta Braves. The baseball team lasted there from 1996 or so through about 2015 and then moved to Cobb County because the stadium, which was about 21 years old, is absolutely useless to them. Uh, in the 20th century, the Athens Games a major financial drain and remain so to this day. Oh, the International Olympic Committee, acting as if it's a sovereign nation, told Italy, change your drug laws. If uh, somebody's caught doping in the uh, Olympic Village, you have tough laws, but they don't apply here. The Olympic Village is ours. Let us take care of it. They're only cheating, and we'll give them a suspension. China becomes more accepted in the world community, hosting the 2008 Games. Oh, and I'm speaking here before you at a library uh, in Vancouver, the Vancouver 2010 Committee. Part of the deal includes that they have the right to censor speak people like me talking about the Olympics if they don't like what I'm talking about. Censorship at the Olympics. Oh, also, hey, if you're Tony Blair, Vladimir Putin, Lula, you got a genuflect. You got to go before the IOC and plead your case. Um, Tony Blair did in 2005. He got the London Games in 2012. Putin did 2007. He got the Sochi Games. Got on his hands and knees, but secured the Sochi Games uh, for Russia in 2014. Uh, the International Olympic Committee in the in the early stages of the 2000s, 24th century, they were interested in Brazil, Russia, India, China, the BRIC countries. Hey, their economies were all hot. They were great. And besides, we have never been down in South America. Brazil is perfect. Their economy is overheating. Um, so they fall in love with those four countries, and they want to get a piece of the action. Why Brazil? The country had a lot of oil, lots of it. And they had money to invest in sports events, but the global economy cratered in September 2008. Price of oil goes down in Brazil. Hey, they still want the games. Um, they're not uh, as financially solvent as they were prior to the crash. Lula was very popular when he left office in 2011. Drop in oil prices, staggering costs of the 2014 World Cup, 2016 Olympics, ended Brazil's ascendancy into the world of the big boy economy. Where's Obama? We want Obama. Why is he here? Where is he? He should be in Copenhagen. Olympic bids are so important these days. Uh, it's surprising that a country would not send its biggest hitter. If the U.S. doesn't match the others, something that will be noticed, said Dick Pound in 2009, the Montreal, the Canada IOC delegate. So, Obama does go to Copenhagen to plead and beg for the Olympics. They got him down on his hands and knees. Um, but Lula was there, and the Olympics fell in love with Lula, the Brazilian president. And they wanted an Olympics, and uh, Obama said Lula was the most popular politician on earth, uh, but um, there, was a, there was money to be made. And that's why the IOC went to Brazil in 2026. Uh, 21st century Olympics, IOC demands local governments pay for any debt accumulated by the games. Sydney, Australia is still paying hundreds of millions of dollars of Australian dollars to maintain unused facilities that were built for the 2000 Olympics. The United States had more troops on the ground in Utah to protect the Salt Lake City Winter Olympics in 2002 than in Afghanistan after the September 11, 2001 attacks. Um, London Olympics, well, the uh, East End was sort of rebuilt with the stadium, but they never came up with how much it cost. 
Uh, did it really cost $51 billion US money or more in rubles for the 2014 Sochi Games in Rio? It was a mess. The International Olympic Committee wanted those games there and Brazilians took to the streets to show they were really unhappy with the Olympics. 2018 South Korea, money loser, but South Korea invited North Korea to participate in the games. Here is Thomas Bach, International Olympic Committee president. The legacy that Bach says today, well, the Olympics have never been as successful as they are now. TV deals through 2032, the bulk of that money coming from Comcast, NBC, and the United States. But uh, Bach can't ignore the fact that there is an issue with the candidate, the candidate process. Lots of cities, including Boston, want no part of it because taxpayers' money is used in perpetuity to pay off the debt. Um, and of course, the Olympic Games used for political purposes, as Bach said, and I said in some countries. The games must go on, and they will be going on. They will be going on in Japan, in Tokyo, starting on July 23rd. Well, I want to thank Ellie for inviting me uh, to uh, the library. Next time, I may be in person, Lucy and Desi, at the end of August. Thank you so much for watching. My name is Evan Wiener. We will see you again sometime in the future. Have a good day, everybody. Bye-bye.